Is there a way to look? Ugh, what the hell? Well, I have one person in here anyways, looks like. Um, why can I not get there? Okay, that's great. Um, Showing something. Not really. I'm trying to 
trying to figure out how to get the chat open. Ugh. There. Okay. Uh, Showing something. Not really. Okay. View ten. All right. So I think there's a delay. there's a delay all right so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit uh, wait hang on a second here there okay uh, all right so I just typed in sync so you guys are gonna see how, how long that takes all right so all right so I think there's a delay yeah there's definitely a delay okay so what I'm all right so uh, okay Jeez, I'm not really happy with some of this, but that's okay. We'll 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 move forward and we'll see how it goes. And uh, I'll I'm gonna have to try to work on it and try to figure it out here before in the next few days. Um, so I think this will be better because I'll be able to actually write some things out for you. So first off, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about prerequisites. So because uh, I, I was flipping through the book today and actually it talks about prerequisites for this course. Now I'm not talking about what uh, ARCC has for prerequisites which is just CICI uh, what, 1006 which is computer science one or, or an equivalent someplace else right you don't have to take it at ARCC. So uh, but the book actually talks about um, them expecting students to have one year of computer science courses under their belt and uh, so let's try this. Yeah. Prerequisites. And that is one year of CS courses. So some of you might not have that much, but that's okay. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get through this. And then the other thing it actually lists is either calculus or uh, discrete mathematics and that has a C in it and mathematics has an A in it and that's an E not an A Jeez. if your professor could spell I might be dangerous <clears throat> but then again I might not be dangerous I don't know <coughs> so uh, that's prerequisites and uh, but I also didn't tell you I didn't really explain as well why this class is important it's not going to be important at ARCC but it will be important eventually for you so let, let me talk about so there's a thing there isn't really a word for the opposite of prerequisites necessarily there is let me see if I can get it post requisite yeah it doesn't actually have it I guess so uh, so let me define post requisite just slightly here so a post requisite is something that will have this course as a prerequisite and I'm going to talk about the, the three different places where I see that as being a, uh, a, a legitimate prerequisite and it's likely most schools will as well uh, and if you go on to a four-year degree you'll then you'll this will be important to you so one of them is in fact have I taught no I've taught two of these three classes so one is operating systems operating operating systems and operating systems is things like studying how uh, a lot of times you don't go into necessarily Windows or or Mac because they're just too complicated to try to understand. But it, it does help you understand a little bit about 
kind of the it lays groundwork for you to be able to understand a little bit about some of the things that operating systems are doing. Um, the next one is compilers uh, or compiler construction, um, and that actually will talk about how to turn code into uh, into machine instructions. And we're talking about machine instructions before when we get there, but uh, that this this course lays the groundwork for being able to understand at least uh, how how compilers are going to work. And then the third one is networking. And of the three, actually, my favorite is probably this third one, which is networking. Although you might find well the others more fascinating as well. Uh, so networking is the study of how we transmit information from one computer to another, which is far more complicated than you'd actually think. Um, in fact, we spend a whole semester learning it in a class, uh, and you still are only barely scratching the surface, especially when you start talking about things like security. Ah, all right. So we've got about a 20 second delay, I see that. Okay, so uh, well, um, I'll see about why that is and, and I'll try to try to figure out what, what's going on. All right, so that that's that's a little bit about that. I, and the reason I, I wouldn't even brought anything up except for I did kind of mislead you in talking about, you know, where what are the needs for this class and, and actually it does have needs in a curriculum. And that's the reason why I wanted to come back and, and talk about this. Uh, yeah, although the prerequisites Really, I could have probably just left that alone and, and, not, and not talked about that at all. All right, so let's uh, then let me go to. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to use the chapters from the book, um, or the 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 sub chapters, but we don't necessarily have to tie into them directly. So, so this one is actually standard uh, standards. Sorry, standards organizations. And I spelled that wrong again. There we go. All right. So, there's three main ones that I want to talk about. Although there are many, many more, um, and, and I'll talk about kind of how how they all kind of relate in a little bit uh, when we get through them. The first one is IEEE. Man, can I make that font bigger? I think so. I'm going to make that bigger. That's a little easier to see. Yeah, Calabria. That works. Okay. So, uh, let's do this. All right, so that should be, okay, yeah, so, okay. So the first one is IEEE. Uh, that is the Institute, Insta, Institute of Electrical and, and, Electronics engineers. <clears throat> uh, this one is is based in the United States. I think actually all of them are loosely based. The third one isn't isn't uh, necessarily based in the United States, although its headquarters is. <clears throat> uh, so what this one does is this this. Uh, it's, it's the largest organization largest organization of technical professionals technical professionals so <clears throat> But it, it has a lots of different things that it, it works on. So one of the things is is that uh, at one point, uh, well, one of the things they govern, govern is the wrong word, because it, they're not really governing anything. Um, they don't have any governmental power. Uh, they're just, they're trying to standardize everything so that everyone does the same kind of thing. And so one of the things they do is 
is wire cut, or I'm sorry, wires. So there's different gauges of wires, and that measures the thickness of the wire. And the lower the gauge, the thicker the wire. It really talks about how many how many of them can you fit in an inch. I think that's right on gauge, <clears throat> but but in any case, the lower gauges are thicker, and uh, not including the jacket. Actually, I think that's how it works. But uh, so. So, but it standardizes how thick that actually is, right? Because if I have two different wire wire companies uh, that are making wire, and I want a 16 gauge wire, I want that to I want to get basically the same wire properties from both of the two companies. And this is this is a way to do that. IEEE actually does this, and that's the way we call it too. We don't say I E E E. We say I triple E. Actually, I should put that first. I triple E. <clears throat> so, but they also govern things with computing. Uh, lots of things, anything that's electrical or electronics based. Um, and so, uh, and it is lots of people who are in it are professionals. They're not government organizations or government people. So that's important. And I think that that'll, that'll be the same across the board here. Okay, so the second one is ANSI, which is the American National Standards Institute. So uh, this is uh, a little bit different, um, and and sometimes it's a little bit of a side grade as well. And this is this they do voluntary cons consensus standards. That's why we have spell check, right? Huh. All right. Well, I have completely. <laughs> uh, so, but the, the biggest thing is, and the same thing is true for the IEEE. Although, uh, if if say I was buying uh, a component, um, in, in fact, uh, Minnesota has one of the better places to buy components f for electronics, and that's at DigiKey, which I've been to several times. Actually, it's really great place. It's in Thief River Falls. Thief River, yeah, Thief River Falls, Minnesota, which is up north. Uh, so uh, if, if I wanted to buy, say, a, some kind of a, a part there, consensus, yeah, see, there we go. Consensus. See, you guys are helping me out. Yeah, I forgot the second hand. See, I put, I spelt it wrong in my notes. That's why I, I think I messed it up. Uh, Oh, processing on YouTube's end, which is interesting because I did live. Well, I guess I did live on the first one. So, okay. All right. So, <clears throat> uh, if I was going to buy a part from from DigiKey for some electronics project that I had, I probably wouldn't. I would shy away from buying any kind of a part that wasn't IEEE approved. So it wasn't in line with their um, their standards. So, and the same with, with ANSI. I, Nash, yeah, national, got that wrong too. Uh, and the ANSI, this is not to be confused with something else we'll come up with later, which is ASCII, which is different. We'll, but we'll, we'll, you'll see that as we come to it. Okay, and then, so here's the thing, is that the ANSI, and part of the reason why you don't really see that one too much is because it's actually wrapped up in the next one we're going to talk about. Because every single country, not every country, but a lot of countries, have their own standard. I think Europe is kind of united under one. Uh, in, 
and sometimes they're government run, sometimes they're not. Most of the time they're not. <clears throat> but uh, the problem is, is then you've got this global network, right? And so it's like the difference between miles and, and kilometers, uh, you know, between the metric system and, and the U.S. system, which we call the standard system, which is kind of weird because there's only a couple countries that use it. So, eh, well, that's the way it is. Uh, so, the, uh, and so we have to make that conversion between the two, and they actually they help they help uh, standardize that as well. Uh, so the next one is is the ISO, and you may have seen anything from them. This is the International Organization for Standard. Standardization. Man, there's a lot of long words today. So, uh, I think I got that one spelt right, though. So, the ISO, uh, and so, they'll even do things like networks, some of the network security ideas. So, uh, this is a non-government, non-governmental body. And so this is, but this is kind of the, so other organizations join, join the ISO. So you can join the IEEE. You could join the ANSI. The, I don't know what they're, uh, I guarantee to you that you can, you can join IEEE. Uh, as a student even, you can join that. Um, and some people find that very attractive. So, <clears throat> but the ISO, the only way to get into an ISO is you have to be a governing body. Of standards and there's like a thousand different groups or something like that it's a, it's an immense there's a lot of different groups that are in it so uh, that is actually that's it that's the only thing I really wanted to talk about here as far as standardized bodies I mean we can talk about a lot of different ones there's a lot of other ones out there um, there are professional organizations and it's it's actually uh, it can be very beneficial for you to be in them because a lot of times they'll have different kinds of trainings or or different uh, information about uh, things in your uh, your line of work or your specialty. They also usually do a conference every year, which you can go to and actually helps network, and those those can be really great. So, uh, okay, so then we go on to the next chapter here. The next chapter is. Historical development. <clears throat> I promise eventually we're going to get away and we won't be doing a lot of typing here. <laughs> but uh, we're going to we're, we'll, we're going to use that today at least. So I want to ratchet this up again maybe what did I do on the other one 22 I'll go to 22 on this one <clears throat> all right I'm gonna I didn't I didn't take I didn't drink enough water last time and my my throat got a little sore so I'm gonna drink some water today okay That's interesting. <clears throat> okay, so let, let, let me just go through them. I'll talk. I'll talk way more than I'm going to write. <clears throat> so the first one we see really, they they call it Generation Zero in the book. So. Generation Zero is computers before electronics. I mean, kind of think of it that way. Before electronics. That seems weird, because we think now computers are computers. But let's think just for a minute. 
we see the word computer and it ends in an ER. Okay, let's think about some other words that end in ER. Driver. Okay, racer. Oh wait, uh, get off that line of thinking. Uh, but it denotes usually in both of those cases, right, both driver and racer, it's talking about a person that drives. That's what a driver is. A racer is a is a person that races. It's, it's actually a little bit more general than that because we can get a cooker. So a cooker is someone who cooks, but it also could be a thing that cooks. So it's something that does the action of that. So then we think about that when we look at the word computer and we say, well, computer is someone who computes. And indeed, this is actually, if we looked up, in fact, I'm going to do that right now. Let's open up. Define computer. An electron, so most of the time, what we think about here is an electronic device for storing and processing data typically in binary form according to instructions given to it in a variable program. Awesome! So, like a phone, or like uh, your laptop, or like the computer I'm using to do this, or you're watching this on. But look, at there's a second definition down here. A person who makes calculations, especially with a calculating machine. Ha! Huh. There's a second definition. So, uh, and in fact, they didn't start using the word computer for the electronic version that we kind of use it as nowadays until much closer to, to, to current times. We're talking 60s or 70s, 1960s or 1970s. All right, so let's go back and actually go back here and talk about when this really starts. And so, so dates are kind of funny because we don't really need to, to talk about dates necessarily on them. But the, the book gives us a couple dates, which we'll go with. It's not really all that important. But it gives those dates up until 1945. Well, geez, 1945, that's, geez, that's World War II. So uh, that's the end of World War II. So it's it's kind of, I don't know how to think about that, but um, it's, it's a distinctive, it's interesting that that's the date. And we'll talk about why that is, actually. It's kind, of, it's kind of interesting. So the, the very first, actually there's kind of a first computer, but it's a calculator. What it does is it adds numbers together. But then, actually, actually, let me start. Blaise Pascal. Now, some people would recognize that name. <clears throat> Blaise Cat Pascal uh, is a famous mathematician. He actually co-discovered calculus. So, <clears throat> he created a calculator. Interesting, right? It helped him do his calculations. So his was just a little bit better, or a different, at least, than uh, the original one. Or original ones, because I'm sure there were more than, more than just one. Not to be outdone, Leibniz also created a calculator. Now his um, was, was called the Stepped reckoner so and part of that might be because right that it sounds a little weird is because uh, Leibniz uh, was German or would have spoke German as his first language probably uh, so that's probably translated to English from German but the uh, the he's the other co-founder of calculus it's kind of interesting both of the two co-discoverers co 
you don't really uh, create mathematics, you discover it. But the, the, uh, the two co-discoverers of calculus uh, both created their own computers, or calculators. All right. So now I'm going to kind of bring us forward. Both those guys, uh, they're, they're, I think, 1700. So they're, they're, they're still a long time ago. So in 1822, we have Charles Babbage. And so Charles Babbage generally is seen as the father of computers. I guess I don't need to capitalize all those, but I did. So in 1922, in fact, actually what I want to do is that, I think. So <clears throat> he created something called the difference engine. So one of the things that's interesting about these early calculators is you were you could you could calculate things, but you had to manually do things to get it to work. Babbage's idea was to make it do some linear algebra with this difference engine automatically. So you would set these levers and you would just set it up and then you would kind of wind it up and let it go and it would give you the answer. Charles Babbage had a friend. I'm going to back up a little bit in time, kind of rewind, and we're going to go back to 1801. And Charles Babbage is in England, so that's important to note. Um, this this next fellow, Jacquard, Jacquard. That's his last name. I, I'm. It's not that important what his first name is. Not not super, anyways. But he he created punch cards. And actually, let me open up. Yeah. find some decent pictures. Okay, here's some decent pictures. So <clears throat> these are punch cards. This is a, a picture of a bunch of punch cards. Here's a, probably a better picture. Uh, this is three different ones. And so the, these are these are not the same ones that Jacquard would have used, but uh, they're similar in, in the way they work. There's holes in there, and then, so what you can do is you feed this into a, the machine, and then the machine recognizes where the holes are, and that tells it, that's like an input, right? So instead of hitting strokes on a keyboard, because they didn't have keyboards yet, it, you would put these cards in, and that's how it would be read. Okay, so, ah, here's a machine that's creating them. These are much later, uh, like I said. Oh, this is a great picture right here. Great picture. So each of these represents kind of a number. It's pretty interesting. And that was early on. That's how the computers uh, worked. Uh, yeah, that's how you could get into and out of them. So he, but he created these punch cards. What he created the punch cards for is he had weaving machines. Now, these weaving machines, uh, we can also call, call them looms. And with the invention of steam power, which is, you know, invented, not invented, but becoming more widespread around this time, he was able to set these looms up and with these punch cards 
and something like it was like a thousand cards or something, or maybe more. He was able to to create fabric without having to have a person sit there and handle moving different threads around and different shuttles. He was able to do it all automatically. Uh, so this this actually leads to the uh, the changing of our the way our technology works and we started automating and because things had in the whole history of the world likely there wasn't too much in the way of automation until Jacquard so that's industrial revolution kind of time and that's and he, he by the way he's a French so I believe he's French yeah I'm pretty sure um, so uh, that's where we see the Industrial Revolution, so that people can become much more productive. Which changes the whole... There's a ton of different things that happen. But eventually it's going to lead to computer science. <clears throat> In fact... Oops. How do I mess this up? Okay. Let's come back to Babbage here. Actually, I'm going to kick this over a little bit. In, in 1833, you see Babbage again. He creates the analytical engine. Here's the thing, though. He got the difference engine to work. He did not get the analytical engine to work. He designed it. It was an improvement. It used those punch cards that he learned about from Jacquard. And this ent actually enters in another character. First computer scientist. Ada Lovelace. So what happened is, as a 19-year-old, she had run into Babbage at some kind of a, a, an event. Um, so re realize, right, Babbage is, is a more upper-class scientist. I mean, all of the scientists, so many of the scientists were upper class because you couldn't afford, no one got educations unless they were upper class at that time. Ada Lovelace is the daughter of Lord Byron, who, if you, he, he, he wrote a bunch of poetry. He's actually quite famous. They didn't actually meet in real life, but it's, it's interesting where it's a, a, a father and a daughter situation where both of them are famous in their own right and completely independent of each other. He knew of her and was, you know, for her. He, he uh, you know, but I'm not sure why they didn't meet. That you'd, you'd have to go look it up. <clears throat> she doesn't get the name. That, that's her married name, by the way. She was the Countess of Lovelace, which actually, that'd be a pretty cool name to have, right? So, uh She, uh, she realized that with these punch cards, you could create something that wasn't, that, where you could set the input. So you could, you could set the input so that it was programmable. And that's why she's, and she actually did that. She actually created uh, computer programs. Now they were fairly simple. Uh, to, uh, to our standards, but at, to her standards, of course, they're revolutionary because she's going from zero to from nothing to to uh, to something. Yeah. Okay. So then, then we get to to um, and there's lots of other people I'm leaving out. There's a tremendous amount of people that I'm leaving out. But we get to the, the next one here, which is Holrith. So in 1890, they were using computers uh, for the for the 
of 1890. For the U.S. Census, U.S. Census. Yeah, I think I got it right that time. So, oh. Okay. I just realized that you guys are not seeing the bottom of that, I bet. Oh, well, let's fix that. Let's see. There, okay. So, he created... He created the more modern punch cards. So that way they could input data into their computing machines. Again, nothing is electronic yet. Not one thing. And that's what Generation Zero is, is pre-electronics. Also later, he founded IBM or international business machines. <clears throat> we'll come back to them because they become a big player later on. But right now they're not. Now we're going to skip forward a bit again. And we're going to say in the uh, 1930s, We get a name a guy by the name of Conrad Zeus. So he he created the first electronic, but we should really put that in air quotes. He created three of them, a Z1, a Z2, and a Z3. So <clears throat> he created the Z1, and he brought, that, brought it to the Nazi government, which were in power in Germany at the time. And he said, hey, you guys could use this for the calculations that you're doing. And the Nazis, in their infinite wisdom, said, nah, we don't think it's any good. It's not useful. We're, we'll just keep using what we've got. And so he continued working on his own. Um, unfortunately, uh, well, okay, so first off, fortunately, he, he continued to try to pitch it to the Nazis, and they, they continued to tell him, eh, nah, just go home. We, we're not going to give you any money. That's basically what they said. We're not going to give you any money to fund your research. Which is probably a good thing uh, for, for the history of the world. And unfortunately, now, uh, Conrad Zeus actually survives the war, but during the Allied bombing in World War II, his, all three of his computers were destroyed. So uh, he was able to recreate them. Uh, they, they aren't electronic in a sense, because they still used many mechanical things, but they, they, they used the same kind of idea as, a, as a, the modern computers. All right, so now let's jump back. And that's the end of that's the end of generation zero. So now we have Gen one. These are the the first electronic computers. Ah, okay. These made use of vacuum tubes to do their work. So again, let's jump out here and look up 
Vacuum tubes. So this is some vacuum tubes, a lot of five of them. There we go. So for $38, you could, you too could own five wonderfully beautiful vacuum tubes. Uh, isn't eBay wonderful? <laughs> uh, so, uh, but the vacuum tubes are like a circuit breaker in some ways today. Uh, if you've ever seen like old electronics and you'll see kind of a pop, something that kind of pops or explodes uh, a little bit, that, that's a vacuum tube blowing, blowing up or going out. So it's like a circuit breaker getting flipped. So we've switched our electronics to circuit breakers now. But they did use this. And part of the reason why they did this is because they could turn them. So let's let's see if we can get a picture of the ABC computer, which we'll come back here. Ah, I don't want to do that. I want to do this. OK, if I could not mess this up. All right, so this is the very first one. Most people consider this as being the first first one. And if you look in here, we can see... Eh, it's not really going to zoom in very far. But what we could do is they could put it in and they could turn... They could take it out and they could turn that vacuum tube a little bit so that would help them program the computer. Notice here, no keyboard. I don't know if that's a printer or not. I haven't really looked into how this all works. <clears throat> but these are all those vacuum tubes. Uh, so let me let me talk a little bit about I'll leave this open. About why oh so the the ABC ABC computer, this this one was doing linear equations. So linear equations is a thing in mathematics. They, they can take quite a bit of time to, to, to figure out, to do the math through. And so if we, we can automate that, boy, that would save us a whole lot of time. And so that's the reason why they were doing it. But why are we, why are we concerned about linear equations? Well, what's going on around this time? Oh, I should put dates on this. 1945 to 1953. What's going on right before this is World War II. So in World War II, the United States government was creating new artillery weapons. Right? The big guns. The problem was, is they needed to calculate how to hit things at specific ranges and at specific elevations. Which is why they wanted, because it took a vast amount of time to, to do the calculations by hand. And so they said, oh, let's get rid of that and let's have these computers. Oh, I need to pick up the pace a little bit. I love this topic, by the way, if you haven't figured that out. So this was, um, that's the reason. Um, so then there's also another one. This one's probably more famous. There's the ENIAC. Now the ENIAC was actually created in secret. Uh, but it be eventually became commercially available. The ABC was never commercially available. I think they just created one. Right? Because it was done for the military, the American military. And so then we see another one called Colossus. I'm not going to put the name up there. The book doesn't even talk about it. And I don't know why, but it doesn't. But Colossus, uh, there's actually, a, uh, there's about a few movies about Alan Turing. Alan Turing is a, a, a very brilliant, very interesting fellow. Uh, and he was associated with code breaking. Uh, during World War II, uh, code breaking the Nazis, um, their, their secret codes, so they could translate their uh, messages sent over the radio. So they were able to, to capture the messages, but they couldn't decode them because they were in a secret code. And so he was able to actually crack that code 
using Colossus. And it was kept under wraps, so nobody was able to, uh, uh, they didn't release it to the public that it even existed uh, until many, many, many years later. So, uh, Alan Turing's a really interesting character. In fact, uh, the most prestigious award in computer science is, is given out annually uh, by the, by AC, I believe by ACM, uh, American Computing Machines, and it is, it's, it's called the Turing Award, uh, and it's given out, yeah, annually to one person. And we'll talk a couple, I'll, I'll get to a couple people that, that are uh, important in that. All right, so uh, that kind of ends Generation 2. Then we have Generation 3. And if we have dates on that, I'm not, I'm not going to do dates, actually, because they kind of overlap with each other, and that's kind of the problem. Uh, so, um, but this, this is uh, transistorized computers, computers, oops, I want that to be in one, it has to be in one, so transistorized computers, this is where IBM comes back into the picture, uh, some of the other companies that were actually really big is DEC, uh, Unisys, and, and this one I want to spend, a, a CDC, and I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this because CDC, different than the CDC, we, which is in our brains nowadays, uh, this is, uh, I'm not sure what it stands for, but, but their headquarters was in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, and and then they moved to Highland Park, Minnesota. So they built the first supercomputer. First supercomputer. We'll talk about what that means. So I'm going to add something here, because that was the name of the first one. The first one was called... And it made use of something called a RISC processor, R-I, let me talk about R-I-S-C, reduced instruction set, code, I think, or it's reduced instruction, now I have to, great, it's going to bother me until I look it up now. Well, it doesn't talk about it in the book. There you go. Um, but it's the first, it was, it used a reduced in instruction set. And, and we'll talk about that more later when we get to that, that portion of the book. Uh, so it allowed it to go faster because there's less, uh, there's less instructions. So it had, it had to spend less time figuring out what to do and more time actually doing it. That's the easy way to kind of think about that. Uh, so there's actually a connection. Now, as you know, I, I talked about last time, I live, yeah, I live in uh, in northern Minnesota in a town, um, and I did talk earlier about wire, and that's because I worked at um, a place that cuts wire here in Bemidji, Minnesota, and they actually had a plant that helped build those computers. Okay. So generation three. Integrated circuits. Integrated circuits, what they did is, so a transistor, right, is basically, it's like the vacuum tube except for it's and it's smaller, and it uh, it doesn't actually blow up when too much electricity is applied. Well, maybe it, I think it probably still can, but it uh, it just requires less electricity. So it, it miniaturizes things, and then we're going to see that as we go along. So integrated circuits were are, are are when it starts actually getting closer to where we are today. 
because what they did is they took a, a piece of a board and then they put the uh, they put the, the circuits on that board. So the transistors were able to be shrunk down and put onto these these boards. Uh, and and this brings in um, three things. That's time sharing, multiprogramming, and this. Um, th we could also call this. I guess we could call this a microchip. And I'm not going to talk any more about that. This brings us up until uh, the late 70s or early 80s. I will talk about something that's actually super fascinating to me, and that's actually I'm going to put it in here. The P A R C or Palo Alto Research Center. Uh, ah, okay, so I just noticed a couple questions here. Uh, question about the homework. Um, I ha uh, when will they get the reading for it? There won't be necessarily a reading for it, um, but, uh, but it will be on Chapter 1. Of the book, so uh, I the, all the questions will be asked. Uh, so because the book isn't required, you don't have to have it. So all I won't just say, hey, go to number fourteen in the book, the chapter one or whatever. No, don't worry about it. It's not not that not that way necessarily. So I'll actually ask you a question, um, and and I, I am anticipate <clears throat> having that out either on Friday or on Monday, and we'll see how that, that goes. I'm, I'll try to get it done on Friday. Might not be until a little bit later in the day. <clears throat> Depends on the weather. Uh, Palo Alto Research Center. Uh, hopefully that answers your question, uh, Bashir. So Palo Alto Research Center, uh, it's actually owned by Xerox. Uh, they almost Almost all of the innovations that we have in computers, even today, were started. Nope, it's not timed. It's all take home. Every single assignment will be take home, and it won't be done. I'll have more information about that next time. I think I'll have to. I'll, I'll get that figured out. So I'll have a document up. So talking about all the different uh, assignments. But good question, though. All right, Palo Alto Research Center. Uh, so oh, almost all the innovations we can think of on computers, uh, things like notebook computers, uh, not cell phones, not, not cell phones, but uh, notebook computers, laptop computers, uh, network, a lot of the networking things were worked out at Palo Alto Research Center, in particular something called Ethernet, uh, laser printers, personal computers, all of those things were first integrated or uh, created at uh, Palo Alto Research Center. Um, the, the GUI system that we use, actually. So the original computers, they don't have a mouse. They don't use a mouse. So the first computer to use a mouse was the Park Alto. Uh, that is groundbreaking, absolutely groundbreaking in the way uh, computer computing is done. The interface, being able to interact with the computer. Uh, because before that, it was all punch cards, and that was it. Or maybe kind of the, the green screens with the typing. So it was very, very basic. It was really difficult to, uh, to interact with the computer. But as soon as you got this mouse, now you can move your mouse around, and how do you click on it, and those kinds of things are groundbreaking. In fact, the people who created it, uh, the two main people that worked on it, or three main people worked on it at Park, they all won Turing Awards. So, uh, and that would be Butler Lampson, Alan Kay, and Charles Thacker. So, <clears throat> one of them, Alan Kay, still does speeches. At up to at least a couple years ago. I don't know if he still does it now. If you want to watch some some really interesting stuff on him, he, he actually does has done talks, and I think they're freely available out there, and you can look them up. He is he's really a, a neat guy to listen to. So uh, if you have some time, uh, go out there and listen to him. And he, he worked on 
uh, a number of different things. But he actually has an interesting thought about the way computers, uh, computers and the development of computers is, is kind of going. It's, he, he's an interesting character. Uh, I'll put his name here. Alan Kay. He didn't know. Park still exists. They don't really use it to. They, it's it's still doing things. Uh, the, and business, actually, people in the business departments, they actually will uh, study Palo Alto Research Center because most of the things that they came up with were never sold by Park. They didn't. They or by Xerox. Xerox never actually used many of the things that they discovered at Park, including. Uh, they, they came out with a personal computer, but they only sold like 1,200 of them. Or, uh, no, sorry, 2,500 of them. All right, so <clears throat> could probably spend some more time. But uh, Generation 4, uh, 1980 to present. You say, well, geez, that's, that's a long time. So it's, it's, it comes from this. This is really... Um, v, uh, VLSR, which is very, very large scale integration. So it's just talking about how many chips are on uh, on a particular board. And so this is uh, the more chips that are on the boards, the faster the computer can be. because And it has to do with miniaturization because as things get smaller, they get closer. As they get closer, things can travel between them uh, faster. And the limiting problem in a computer is really traveling from one place to another. The electronic information traveling from one place to another. And we can actually measure it based on uh, how fast electricity travels. Because all of our computers now are electronic. Although there is a push to try to move to some other kinds of systems, like quantum computing, which is really interesting and kind of above my head a little bit. Maybe it, that's the wrong way to say it, but it's, it's uh, they do, when, when you see presentations on them, they do a lot of hand waving, like, this is how it works in theory. But they do have some that are out there that work. But it's, it's fascinating stuff. So to uh, go out there and, and look at that. So this is uh, Intel. So let me talk at least a little bit. Well, well, I'm just about, just about out of time. Well, I want to save a couple minutes here at the end. So this is where Intel comes in. So... <clears throat> It's interesting the story of how Intel becomes important. Because IBM, which was making mainframe computers, making these big, big computers, it, and when it came time to try to create a personal computer, they wanted to release a personal computer. But as is with most big organizations, they're unwieldy. They're, it's hard for them to innovate quickly. And so they 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 wanted to come out with this personal computer but they didn't have any of the the research or any of the parts done and so <clears throat> they actually turned to this company that was making chips for them microchips for them and that was intel and they said hey intel do you have a uh, a, a processor that we can get from you and they did and so intel sold them the processor but they reserved the rights to, to sell it to other people, which is why IBM does not control the, the PC market uh, because Intel simply just sells to whoever wants to, to, to make them, um, like Gateway or Alienware or any of the others that are out there. Also, IBM did not have an operating system when they were ready to do their personal computer. And they got, they talked to Bill Gates. And Bill Gates, he didn't have an operating system either. 
but he bought an operating system for somebody else and then he sold it to IBM and that's how Microsoft got started as well. He didn't sell it, sorry. He licensed it to them, which is why Microsoft also is independent of IBM because IBM was more concerned about getting it out into the market and they were successful at this. And part of the reason why they were in such a hurry is because Apple computers, the first Apple computers, had started hitting the market in the uh, 1980s. And so, uh, and it's interesting to note is that Apple was trying to do some things that Palo Alto Research Center knew how to do, but Apple didn't. They couldn't figure it out. And so they went to Palo Alto Research Center and toured the place. And I don't know that they stole from them. But at least they got the idea that thing, certain things were possible. And so there were some ideas and brainstorming ideas that kind of moved them forward with it. So that's interesting. Okay. So both Apple and Microsoft are tied in some ways to the same kind of place. Now also, Microsoft used to write software for Apples, for Apple computers, and that helped them steal some, steal some things from them. In fact, uh, they were sued by them. Many years ago, they lost the suit. Apple sued Microsoft for stealing things from them. Um, and largely, they lost that suit because the argument was made by lawyers that, well, yes, they stole it from you, but you stole it from Palo Alto Research Center. So you have a real hard time saying it's yours. So, so this is where we see Microsoft, right? Microsoft and then Apple. Okay, so now I do want to talk about one more thing. Because I talked a little bit about miniaturization. So there's something called Moore's Law. And he came up with this. Oh, I spelled this wrong. Moore's Law. So Moore's Law states the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit double every two years. What that means is, because there's some th implications from this, it means that it will get twice as fast. And Moore's Law has actually held up Kind of. For a while, they used 18 months because it was much. We were going faster than that, but um, we're continuing on that pace. Although it will die, it will end eventually uh, because there is only so thin of a wire that you can have, or so close that you can put two circuits together. Sorry, integrated circuits together without the electricity jumping between the two. So, um, eventually it stops. Uh, I, I was told when I was an undergraduate that it would, be, it would stop in the next, uh, you know, 10 years. Well, that 10 years came and went, and then another 10 years came and went. It's still holding up, although the rate of advance has slowed significantly. Um, it is still in front of Moore's Law, but not by much. So there's a second Moore's Law as well. It says the cost of computing power uh, Oh, okay, wait. As the cost of computing power falls. So the other thing with this is as transistors get closer together, the cost actually goes down because it's smaller and smaller, less and less space that you need. So as the cost of computing power falls, the cost that the producers need to fulfill Moore's Law or to continue to innovate as fast as they have been, it goes up. And so if this holds forever, and this, is, this still holds today, so it, it's costing more and more for Intel to develop new chips. If that, as that continues, 
eventually it won't it won't be cost effective to be able to, to continue it to continue doing the the work. All right. Uh, and then there's another one called Rock's Law, and I'll let you look that up um, if you like. R O C K, Rock's Law, uh, that actually talks about this price problem uh, that that that's going on. So I know I kind of sped through some of this stuff at the end. I I probably could spend a whole hour lecturing just on all the things at Palo Alto Research Center. I wish I could have spent more time on that, but I, I did not. That's absolutely worth a read uh, uh, if. If you, uh, if you have time, um, all the really neat stuff, including, by the way, Palo Alto Research Center. Uh, actually, it wasn't developed at Palo Alto Research Center, but it was at, at, developed in the 60s, virtual reality. Virtual reality goggles, those were created in the 60s, and they've been perfected and perfected and perfected since then. So um, I guess I'll, that's all I really have for today. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Uh, my guess is you guys are just firing away on them. So if there's questions, go ahead and ask them. But um, but if not, I think we'll be done here. So uh, I'll wait a few minutes. Uh, we're at at 8:20, and that was our that's kind of our scheduled end time. So. We'll see how this goes, but I'll wait a few minutes here to see if there's any questions that come up. Um, if not, I'm just going to close down the stream and then we'll be done. Um, and like I said, I'll try to see if I can't uh, get an assignment out to you guys uh, by Friday. So, All right. We have one person who's ready to be done. <laughs> I think I'm ready to be done, too. I'm ready to have maybe have another drink of water here. I promise this is water. I really do. I promise it. And it is. So it's all good. All right. Thank you, guys. I will see you again. We'll, we'll do an... Uh, okay. Well, will there be a problem if you don't meet any of the prerequisites? Uh, if you're in the class currently, no, nope, there's no problem. Um, if you're not in the class yet, uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> if you don't meet any of the prerequisites... Well, uh, you might find it very difficult to, to get through the material in this course, but that doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means you're going to have to spend a lot more time uh, getting there. That, that's, that's the thought there. All right. All right, I'm going to end it, and I will, I'll talk to you guys again. Uh, we're going to do it again tomorrow night. I'll... Uh, I think I think the the problem was with the YouTube was I had created the stream on YouTube, not on OBS. So if you have any suggestions for anything that I'm using or doing that you think that I could do better, um, feel free to send them because I know I'm not doing a good job yet. But we'll we'll, we'll get there. We'll we'll continue to to work on this. Um, also, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna post these online, so you're gonna have at least these notes here. So, all right. I will talk to you guys again tomorrow night. All right, bye-bye.